I want to close the program today by saying it a couple weeks ago, and it got quite a bit of attention, and I wanted it to. I, I wouldn't have said it on a goddamn podcast available across the world for free if I didn't want it to get attention. But I wasn't saying it just to get attention. It was the way I felt. It, I spoke the truth. If anybody, as a matter of fact, about Mr. Russo, if anybody, my same challenge that I give everybody, if somebody can show me that what I say is demonstrably not true, and yes, actually, there is an asterisk. Come to find out, I did wear a yellow jacket in TNA, but it wasn't canary yellow. It wasn't my custom-made old manager heat getting canary yellow. It was a nice, pale yellow jacket that I got here from one of the finer men's stores that they had when the, when the derby clothes came out. Because we are a folk who like to wear colorful clothes here in Louisville, Kentucky during the spring for derby season. But, but Shame uh, on us. But, Jim, I got to ask something because I've seen uh, people post that clip, obviously. But wasn't that clip from – about a year after the email that he sent Dixie about you wearing the canary yellow jacket? Well, yes, but I wore it more than once, so I'm willing okay. to even even that close. Even okay. that close. The point is, anybody that can, can can prove to me that something that I say about somebody or here on the program is demonstrably untrue, I will admit it. And while that does have an asterisk because the, the, the description canary yellow didn't fit, it was a yellow jacket. So I admit that. However, some people like the Republicans, like Russo, don't really understand and get it getting to the root of a situation. They try to obfuscate the, uh, the issue with a bunch of gaga. The point is that I said what I thought about this motherfucker. And I said that I had pulled out of WrestleCade in Winston-Salem this Thanksgiving because I refused to be in the same place with him at the same time because I promised my wife and I promised myself – that I wouldn't hire any more lawyers and I wouldn't get any more trouble. And everybody knows, and we've admitted, I brought you on as my anger management therapist. That didn't work out well, so I just made you my co-host. Because <laughs> you started making me madder than some other people. We wasn't even trying. <clears throat> but I, I, I said what I thought about this fucking guy. I told people what kind of fucking asshole he is. He's a shit stain on life. I explained it. I broke it down. Thought that was going to be the end of it. Well, of course, because he's such a fucking attention whore. He's like the kid that fucking pulls his pants down and shakes his wee-wee at the other kids on the playground because he wants people to look at him. He couldn't get the thrust of my meaning. And first he put out a challenge. Oh, meet me face-to-face on Skype. <laughs> on my podcast. Then he then he, m- he mitigated that. Don't have to be on my podcast. It'd be on your podcast or anybody else's podcast. Just and then he actually got some of the eggs with four followers that have tweeted twelve times. I think it's like I said, it's it's either maybe it's Disco Inferno since he's not employed these days. He's got plenty of free time. Or I understand now there's a little fucking water carrier named Jeff Lane that actually writes all of Russo's shit on his website because everybody knows Russo can't read, write, or spell. Uh, he, he can read. He just refuses to. He's been on record as saying he doesn't read, hates to read, a writer that hates to read. But he can't write and he can't spell. So he's got this fucking stooge named Jeff Lane that, that, you know, he tickles his balls every once in a while when Russo wants him to. And he writes all the stuff for him. And he's another one of these guys that Russo takes advantage of because he's desperate to be fucking around who he thinks are important people. So anyway... He, he, he tried the challenge uh, to get me on the podcast face to face. Like that would, like that would somehow solve anything. Like we could talk it out. Like uh, this is a burning hatred that I want to murder this motherfucker. And there's been (laughs) fucking lawyers brought into this before. And somehow he thinks that we could talk it out on a podcast. He just wants attention. That's all he wants. So then he even made a challenge and listen to this. I don't listen to this stuff because I can't stand to hear that fucking voice. I have nightmares about it. But people obviously want to tell me about it. But the one clip that I did listen to for like a minute, minute and a half, was when he tried to to make me feel bad. Sort of like when Heyman presented that deal to Dixie Carter. You remember this, right? Yes. A couple years ago, they were talking about, well, Heyman's the one that can save TNA. And Heyman is a smart guy, and he knew that there's no way that even he could do anything with fucking TNA. So to make himself the baby face, 
he gave Dixie the one deal that he knew that she would never go for, which is you give me a piece of ownership in the company and I'll come in and work for you and save your company. And of course she said no. And then he could go with his hands and conscience clear <laughs> and he could say, well, I tried, but she wouldn't, uh, you know, give me the deal I wanted. So that, because he knew he, it would just ruin his reputation because it was insalvageable. So Russo goes on the challenge now. Well, let's do it for charity. And he actually couldn't think of the name of the Cauliflower Alley Club. He actually kept stammering, you know, that, that, that organization, that organization that, that helped old wrestlers. It, it's called, it, it, it's that they help old wrestlers. And it's called, it's called. Then he finally muddled out Collie, as in Lassie. Lassie the Collie. Cauliflower Alley Club. All the proceeds from our big debate on some podcast, whether it be mine or his or some neutral podcast, would go to the Cauliflower Alley. Like, what proceeds would that be, you numbnut sack of snake feces, you gum-bumping asshole? My podcast makes just the same amount of money regardless of who's on it or who's not on it. I don't know where the fuck, but this was a, a, a desperate attempt by him to be a baby face like I'm turning down the opportunity. I've been a Cauliflower Alley Club member since the 80s. He couldn't even think of its fucking name because that's how much respect he has for the wrestling business and the people in it. None. And it was a publicity stunt. But I want to just illustrate to you, you fucking whiny little fucking cunt. Because I know you're going to listen to this because you have to because you're such a fucking attention whore. Every time somebody speaks your name, you've got to know about it. You've got to listen to it. So, you fucking disreputable douchebag, let me make this as clear as I possibly can again using the English language. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what my week was like last week before I left for Oklahoma. I went out on Sunday afternoon. And I worked in the yard at Castle Cornet, and I sawed some limbs, and I carried some brush, and I fucking did some work, and I came in the end of the night, and I looked down at my hand, and my wedding ring was gone. And I've narrowed it down to maybe a, a almost two square acre area that I was in at the time, so there's, it's gone for good. So, all right, the next day I get up and I fucking empty my hot tub, drain the hot tub, and I wipe it all out and get it spick and span and sparkling and fill it back up with water and think, oh, it's going to be so great to get in it. I turn it on. One of the seals on one of the jets is cracked. It's spraying a leak. Do you know how long it takes to drain, clean, and refill an eight-person hot tub? A long time, Brian. I'm sure. So I wasn't happy about that. And then finally, the day before I leave for Oklahoma, Stacy goes over to Walmart. Now, I, I have to mention, I do not go to Walmart. I refuse to go to Walmart because the fucking Walton family, like the rest of these rich Republican cocksuckers, the Walton family has as much money as the bottom 130 million people in the United States of America. And they have that partially because they pay their fucking workers like shit, like invent, indentured servants, like fucking slaves. To the point where people who work full time at Walmart still have to sometimes go on public assistance to pay their bills and support their families so that these rich cocksuckers can get richer, which basically means that all of us who pay taxes in this country are subsidizing these rich fuckers business while they sit there on top of fucking hundreds and hundreds of billions of fucking dollars and people that's working for them in their fucking slave labor goddamn fucking camps that they call stores have to get food stamps or fucking welfare have shitty insurance. So fuck the Walton family for one thing, but I digress. <laughs> Stacy likes to go there cause it's close and it's fucking easy, right? So I won't go in it. She goes over to pick up a few things and I'm sitting here in the office and she calls me on the phone. And she says, I'm at Walmart. A taxi cab driver's just pulled out and hit my car. What do I do? Because she's never had an accident. She's never even had a speeding ticket. I said, call the cops and report the accident. You've got your insurance card. I'll be right there. So I hop in the car and I drive over there. Well, when I get there, I pull up. She's standing there. She's writing down the fucking taxi cab's uh, fucking license plate. And this guy's standing beside his cab. And when I get out of my truck, I say, are the cops on the way? And she said, no, they won't come because it's private property. And this guy won't even give me his name, much less his insurance information, even though we're supposed to work it out for ourselves. So she's writing this shit down and taking pictures and everything. I must say, number one, 
Did, I don't know whether you knew this, but the cops will not come for a fender bender on Walmart property because it's private property. You're supposed to work it out amongst yourselves. Did you know that, Brian? I never knew that, no. Well, that's a fact, but I do know now also, did you know that if eight or ten people at the same time call 911 and say there's fixed to be a hell of a fucking brawl and possibly a murder out here in the goddamn Walmart parking lot, you better come quick, they will come? <laughs> that I could have said, yes. I know that now, too, because as soon as, as she tells me the cops ain't coming to his private property and he won't tell me his name, I ask her, where did he, because her car is on the other side of the cab at this point, I said, where did he hit you? And this motherfucker comes up and starts yelling at me. And guess what? Maybe he's a listener of the Jim Cornette experience, and maybe he's been offended because I don't know this for a fact, but there was a pretty good chance he's a Muslim. And possibly he's been offended by some things I said last year. Because he starts screaming, she hit my car, she hit my car, she is reckless, she was going 50 miles an hour. It's there in you know the in front of Walmart they've got the place painted off even though it's not a curb it's the place painted off it's the fire lane it's the place you're not supposed to fucking pull onto it's right in front of the front door okay well that's where he's pulled over in this painted strip place and he's fucking apparently just let out a fucking uh, affair and she has just crossed a crosswalk where she had to wait for people to cross before she continues moving on And then she's going by the cab that's halfway in the line of traffic and halfway over onto this area where he stopped. And as she's passing him, not at 50 miles an hour, because she would have to go from zero to 50 in 22 feet. I don't think Ford Focus will accomplish that fucking piece of uh, auto racing. He just don't look and pulls out. And when he pulls out the front left of his fucking car, smashes into the side of her door, spotless car, didn't have a ding on it. And since she's still moving, it scraped all the way to the fucking end of the car. So he's obviously at fault. And he's also now screaming at me. Well, what happens when somebody screams at me, Brian? Uh, Did you have a tennis racket? No, I had one of my blackouts. Uh-oh. We've talked about the anger management issue. Yep. When he starts screaming, she hit me, she hit the motor car, she is reckless, she was going 50 miles an hour. The next thing I know, I'm nose to nose with this motherfucker. He's backed up uh, into his cab and leaning back over his fucking trunk. I'm screaming, I'm going to rip your fucking throat out and kill you, you cocksucker, you motherfucker. I'll fucking rip you limb from fucking limb. She's trying to pull me back. Eight or ten people are on their phone dialing 911. Every male employee of Walmart is hitting the doors. It looked like a fucking run-in at a Bill Watts fucking pull-apart. I don't know what I said before then, and I actually don't know what I said for the next couple minutes because, as I've mentioned before, I have these blackouts, such as when I took a baseball bat to Casey O'Connor's car and cleaned out every piece of fucking glass in it, including the headlights and taillights in 1994, or when I tried to kill that fucking outlaw wrestling promoter whose name I will not mention in Knoxville on Magnolia Avenue in front of God and everybody at five o'clock and tried to run him down with my fucking car after he'd maced me and had to pay a lot of money for that one. And I pleaded guilty to reckless driving, but he ain't bothered me again because he considers himself lucky to be alive. And he is because if he hadn't thrown his fucking sound guy in front of me where the sound guy went up over the hood of my car and I hit the brakes, I would have killed him. I have these blackouts where I'm not responsible for what I fucking do because I don't know what I'm fucking doing because I've got an anger management issue, which is why I take myself out of these things and I don't be around people who cause. That's why I almost fucking choked Greg the office boy in Ring of Honor. That's why I've done numerous other things in my life. So I've taken myself out of these equations. But now simply trying to go and aid my wife in a fender bender because this fucking asshole wanted to get up in my face I've blown up again, and now here come the fucking cops. <laughs> and she got me before I snatched him around the neck, but my thing was I was going to snatch him around the neck with the left hand and take my fucking right hand and try to gouge both his fucking eyes out. And I was uh, on the proceedings of doing that when people started coming and everybody got in between us. So anyway, point being, nobody was arrested, but they did give us paperwork to fill out. And, of course, come to find out the guy's insurance is sketchy. Our insurance company that's reputable said that it looks like some of that shit that you get ordained as a minister online. And 
blah, 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 and I've already talked to my attorney, and they've subpoenaed the uh, security camera video from Walmart, and I'm probably going to have to spend about $5,000 to get $500 deductible back, but I am going to make this motherfucker's life a living hell because I don't like him, and I wish he'd fucking drop dead right now. But I'm not going to kill him. But the moral to this story, Vince Russo, you obnoxious, overbearing piece of fucking shit, you attention whore, you have sent emails to everybody I know that we both know, including Sean Oliver. Sean Oliver writes me and says, I know there's not been enough money printed, but I just want to tell you that Russo's writing me saying, please, you've got to talk Cornette into doing something with me. It can benefit all of us, all of us in capitals, because in capitals is the way that he really emphasizes shit. I just want to tell you, Vince Russo, that I will never do anything with you. I will never work with you. I will never have any cooperation with you. I won't speak to you on the fucking phone. I won't speak to you on fucking Skype. I won't speak to you in person because I don't want to pay a goddamn attorney or potentially go to prison for what I might do when I black out and do what I've always wanted to do to you and all of your attention getting and all of your bullshit and all your fucking podcasts with your stooges like this Jeff Lane character and this disco inferno suck up that likes to blow you because you're the only one that's giving him a job in the last fucking 20 years. All these other fucking people. I don't care what they think. I don't care what people like you think because I don't want people that like you to like me. I don't make any money off this. I turn down money to work with you. And what's more, I spend money. I will spend money to cost you money. It is my hobby and my life's work to make sure that you don't make another dime in this fucking business. And any penny that I can prevent you from fucking making, I will consider a million dollar gift to me. But I just want to leave you with this, you fucking moron. You think that you're safe. Because I said that I wouldn't go to prison for you. Well, I can change my fucking mind. So I'm just telling you, you fucking whiny little cunt, if I will try to rip the throat out of some cab driver that I've never seen before, imagine what I would do to you. So the only way that I will meet you or cooperate with you in anything is if you want to set up a time and a place where just the two of us with no cameras, no witnesses, No audio, no video, just you and me can be there and we can work things out amongst ourselves. And if you want to sign a release ahead of time that neither side, me included, is going to call the fucking cops or hire a lawyer, I'll pay any price to be there. But that won't happen because you're a gutless, dickless fucking coward. I'm surprised your wife will even fuck you with that microscopic dick of yours, you piece of shit. And if I were you, I would have goddamn DNA tests done on your kids because I refuse to believe that you could get hard enough to penetrate her to shoot even a lick of fucking sperm into her to the point where you could have fucking children so i have a feeling that those are probably the mailman's or maybe even the milkman's you (laughs) fucking moron now can you understand that did i make that plain enough for you in english that you can understand you new york cocksucker i hate you i want you to die and the only way that i will meet you is someplace just the two of us all alone with an assurance that neither side will call the cops or the lawyers after the thing is over with. When you can can come up with that fucking deal for me, son, then you get a hold of me. The rest of it, you keep running your fucking dick liquor because nobody believes it because everybody, thanks to me and a few other people who have brought this to light, knows that you're nothing but a piece of shit and that's all you'll ever be. So I hope I have clarified For the sake of people who are listening, this little fucking disagreement that we seem to have had over who's going to do what for what charity and how much. And by the way, if you would agree to meet me like that, I'll give $5,000 to the charity of your choice. And I might have to pay for your funeral too. Because I'd like nothing better. I would get the biggest raging heart on in the world if I took a baseball bat and caved your skull in where your brain splattered farther than a goddamn hand grenade blowing up in the middle of a jello factory, you fucking asshole. So fuck you, fuck your family, fuck everybody else that has anything to do with you, and fuck anybody that looks like you. I hope I've settled this once and for all.